Good morning, church. So good to see all of you guys this morning. Would you stand with us? We're going to go into a time of worship together. Put your hands together. I'll praise in the valley. I'll praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure.
desperate for you desperate for you I surrender
you know, I love this song because it ultimately it's it's a challenge. It's saying, I will make room. I will make room for you. And I think often when we come before Jesus, we expect him to make the room for us. And, and yes, he, we, we know that because of what he did on the cross, he will go to no end for us. But there comes a point in our faith where we have to decide, no, Lord, I'm going to make the room in my life for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push through the crowd to get to you. I've been reading through the Gospels, and there's a story in the New Testament of, of this woman, and she had an issue of, of bleeding for 12 years. 12 years. And she went to so many doctors and so many physicians, and the Bible says she spent all of her money trying to get well, and, and instead she just got worse. And she finds herself in this crowd with Jesus, and if you can imagine the people just standing shoulder to shoulder, there's no room. It, it just, people want to be where Jesus was. They were, they were fascinated who this man was. And so here she finds herself in this crowd, and she thought to herself, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know I will be made well. The faith that she had. And so we don't see her stay where she was in church. In fact, she was actually not ceremonial. She wasn't supposed to be there. Traditionally, like this song says, I, like get rid of tradition. She wasn't supposed to be in that crowd. She was considered unclean, but she said, I need to be where Jesus is. And so she pushes through the crowd. She, she makes her way and she touches the hem of his garment and she's healed. And I just wonder what things in our life we're waiting for God to break through, but Jesus, he, he's waiting for us to make the move and say, what, what things do you need to let go of? What things do you need to push past? What things do you need to move forward in so you can get to where I want you to be? One touch. It only takes one touch from Jesus. So this morning, as we go together in prayer, I just wonder, what, is, what are those things in your life? Where are those addictions? What are those struggles? What, what are those thoughts? What are those patterns in your life that you feel like you can't break? One touch. The spirit of the living God, it, it, he's here. His presence is here and he wants to meet with you. He wants to have an encounter with you this morning and he wants you to make room for him to do what only he can do. And so maybe where you're at, would you just bow your head and, and, and think about, God, what are these things in my life that I need to, that I need to, push past in the crowd? What are these things in my life that I need to let go of? What are these things in my life that I need to simply make more room for you? Because I want to encounter you. I want your presence. I need your presence. I need your touch. So Jesus, this morning, as crazy as it is, and maybe as, as crazy as we may feel, God, we will do whatever it takes to make room for you. We will push past whatever it is, no matter how uncomfortable, no matter how painful, no matter how, how awkward it may be, Jesus, getting to you is all that matters. And so we push past the struggle, God. We push past the excuses. We push past the doubts. We push past the pain. And God, we say, whatever it takes, God, we want to get to you because we know it's only it only takes one touch from you. So Jesus, I pray that you would, as, as we take steps of faith this morning to get to where you are, I pray that you would meet us there. God, no matter how, how painful it may be, Jesus, God, give us the faith. Give us the, the boldness, the courage to just say, I just need to get to where you are. God, would you speak to your people? Would you, would you meet them exactly where they are at? Would you heal lives? Would you transform lives? God, would you break bonds this morning, Jesus? God, we know that your presence is here and we are just simply hungry for more of you, hungry for something new. Spirit of the living God, would you fall in this place? Would you fall on your people? Would you fall in their homes? God, wherever they go, we are hungry for a new awakening of you. And so Father, we are ready. We are here to receive whatever it is you have for us. And we're making the move to come to you. We're making the move to get to where you are this morning. God, would you anoint the word? Would you open our hearts, open our ears to hear what you have to say? Would you transform us from the inside out? We don't want to walk out the same people that we walked in. We want to be more like you, Jesus. All of the glory and all of the honor belongs to you and to you alone. And we lift your name on high this morning. In your precious and your holy name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Church, it's so good to be with you this morning. Would you take some time before you sit down and to greet the people around you, say hi, be friendly. Good morning, True Grace. If this is your first time here, we just wanna give you a very special welcome. There's actually a next step card in the seat back in front of you. If you wouldn't mind filling that out, then after the gathering, you can take it right outside the double doors to our guest services table, where there's a friendly face waiting to answer any questions you may have, and they wanna exchange that card for a free gift. And if you're joining us online, you can actually fill that card out on our website and somebody will reach out and connect with you. A couple of things we have coming up this week. On Friday night, we have our selfless date night. This is a chance if you are married to come together with your spouse, have some fun, have some laughs, and really invest in your marriage. And at the same time, there will be the All Things Kids Conference. This is for kids birth through fifth grade. It's a time where you get to fill up in your marriage and your kids get to have a time of worship and fun and just really get to grow in who God is. And so if you have not registered for either of those events, make sure you go to the events page and do that now. Um, lastly, we have our newcomers lunch coming up October 6th. This will be after the second gathering, right downstairs in room 120. If you are new to True Grace, if you've been here maybe for a few months, maybe this is your first time, this is a great opportunity to get to know some of the pastors and the staff, to ask questions and just really hear the heart behind True Grace. So I encourage you to register for that event as well. It is a free lunch, um, but we just wanna make sure we know exactly how many people are coming so we have enough food. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the rest of the gathering. Hi, my name is Jamie. Uh, I'm here getting baptized because God spoke to me at a camp this summer. So I signed up to get baptized and now I'm here. I'm Bruce Hardy, and when I came to Jesus was when, back four years ago in August, my mom got clean, and I thought Jesus saved my mom, and we started going to church. And why I want to get baptized is to show my family and friends that I follow Jesus. My name is Sienna Perry and I came to know Jesus because of my parents. I've grown up in a Christian home and um, going into middle school and stuff, uh, I have a lot of classmates that like vape and like some of them drink and they do like all this bad stuff and um, you know it just makes me realize I don't want to live like that. I would prefer the Christian life, the only right way to live with Jesus and I want to be baptized because um, that I only want to follow him. I don't want to put my trust in anything else. Hi, I'm Vanessa and I'm here to get baptized. I've been wanting to do it for a really long time. Just haven't had the, I had a, a whole bunch of excuses on why not to. So today I'm ready to take that plunge. My name is Johnny Mapu. I came to know Jesus at a very young age, but as of recently, I came to know him at a very low point in my life. And the reason why I decided to get baptized is because when I was little, I got baptized, but now I really truly understand what it means to get baptized. And this is the next step in my journey. My name is Jonathan Nakamura, and I came here to know Jesus because ever since I was little, I really didn't know Jesus. I always went to church, but the church I went to, it was like, they didn't speak English. It was like uh, my family's language. So I've just always been around and then ever since like I've been my girlfriend and her family, her family like really like, like, I don't know, I feel like they planted a seed in me and just, I've just been feeling great ever since and I feel like I was always missing something and that was Jesus and I just always felt empty and I feel like ever since I got to know Jesus, it just filled that empty space in my heart. So that's why I feel like I got to know Jesus and I want to get baptized today because, I don't know, I feel like it would be good to just like drown all the all the old stuff and just a new life, like be reborn again.
Man, it's fantastic, isn't it? So many stories of people getting baptized, and I keep hearing that same thing from each person, like my faith got real, and because my faith is now mine, and it's real, and I'm owning it, and I'm walking in my faith, I'm actually living in faith, now I need to make sure I get baptized because this is personal and real to me, not just I go to church or I'm a nice person. And so big time, uh, just praise to all you guys who made that step and made that happen in getting baptized. If you haven't been baptized yet because you made a decision to follow Jesus and your faith is real now, let us know. Stop by the information counter down by the coffee shop and say, I need to get baptized and we'll help you make it happen uh, no matter what it takes, all right? I'm going to receive the offering today. It's uh, my privilege. And two weeks ago, I gave you, um, I've been challenged recently, like we need to show people what, what they're giving is going to, like how we're changing the world in our church. And so a couple weeks ago, I showed you a kid kitchen in a Malone assembly and, and I said man you didn't even know this but you bought the appliances for that kitchen as we heard about the need we were able to just pay for those appliances in another church which was cool and um, I got a report from our missions team and uh, some things that have happened there um, <clears throat> just real quick we set aside thousands and thousands of dollars for our interns next year to all the interns can go on a mission trip to help make that happen for our young people to go on that trip um, we raised many missionaries we picked up new missionaries we had a missionary in South Africa uh, whose car just died. Uh, we sent her a couple thousand dollars help with that. We started a, we have a one-time donation to a special needs school uh, here in the States. It's a mission organization, so we helped with that. We sent a thousand dollars to Mission Aviation Fellowship for fuel for their airplanes so they can continue to do what God's asked them to do. Uh, we did a matching grant. Our kids went to camp, and there was a big offering for kids to give to missions. And we got a phone call saying, hey, we've got a bunch of kids here. Would your church match like a $2,000? offering and I just quickly emailed our mission team they all said yes kids gave more than two thousand dollars so we doubled that and they actually said at kids camp there's a church in Lacey that's going to double today's offering and our kids were at that camp and they're like right on my church is going to like match whatever we give and so so many things um, have come up and then the one that I really wanted to report to you on was last November we had a young pastor come in here um, he, I think he's only known the Lord for like five years I think he comes out of the Middle East his name is Tony and he came and stood on our platform last November and he said everybody's leaving Seattle everybody's giving up on Seattle like there's less and less churches in Seattle all the time no one's planning a church in Seattle he said my wife and I are going to plant a church in Seattle and we all said you're crazy and we said we'll help you and so we gave a generous offering. So this is, this is a picture of that day last November. Tony uh, came up here and cast the vision for what they're trying to do. And uh, he came to our church and said, would your church give? Would you help us to put a brand new church in Seattle? So they started a church about six months ago, kind of with those Easter launch things at a church. And they were renting a facility, trying to make it happen. And another church, mostly people in their 70s and 80s, said, you know what? We have a building we need a younger movement. Will you come and be a part of this church? And now you have a building to meet in every single Sunday. So this church is taken off with their own brand new building. They were just absolutely like shocked. And so I said, I'm going to tell our church that, that the, the, what we got to pour into that, that new church is meeting in Seattle right now um, with new life and new people, new energy. We're part of that. So there's so many ways that our giving changes the world. Thank you for that person there. You're awesome. And when somebody steps out in faith, I think it's just kind of like, hey, we can all help. Uh, when a missionary steps out or somebody says, I'm going to start something, I'm going to do something, it's fun to get behind people like this. Um, also, last week we mentioned there's a, a special offering. Our church is sending a team down to Costa Rica. They need about $10,000 to, uh, to get all the materials like purchased so when they get there, they can do all the construction and the work. So there's an envelope on your seat back in front of you. Can somebody tell me what color that envelope is because there's several colors down there. But it's like a manila color, right? Uh, something like that. It's a manila envelope. So if you want to help out, we want to make sure we don't send 22 people and they get there and they go, well, we have a few bricks and, you know, one shovel. Uh, we want to make sure that we can send all the materials ahead so that they can do that. So if you want to give to that, um, be part of that ministry down there, they're building an entire uh, discipleship, like training area for churches and leaders and it's just going to be amazing. And so when people say, hey, I'll, I'll give up the $2,500 and I'll give up two weeks of vacation, Think about that. I'm looking at us going, well, we could sacrifice some finances so that you're giving up the big sacrifice. We could help you make it happen. So I want to pray over that, uh, all these kind of things that we're doing. But I just want to say, number one, thank you. This week, everybody got paid. You know, all, all the, the lights are still on. But more than that, we're changing Seattle. We're changing the world. And all these missions giving and all these cool things and churches, just fun to get behind that. So I just want to say thank you for your giving. I'm going to pray. 
I like the people right here in the front. They're doing a good job today. All right, can we pray? Lord, we again uh, just ask God that money would not be a hurdle or an idol in any way in our lives. Lord, you know that we have needs and we ask God that you would meet those needs. Lord, we do believe that you can do more with 90% than we can do with 100. So God, as a pastor, as a friend, God, I just pray blessings on everyone who's giving to fund this, this uh, mission, God, down in uh, Costa Rica. Everyone who helped make this church happen in Seattle. Everyone who gave, Lord, so we could provide kitchen appliances. And Lord, all the, the myriad of ministries, God, that come out of this church and all the missionaries, God, thank you for generous people. God, we ask your blessing on this offering and, uh, God, uh, our giving today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hi, my name is Barry, and this is why I serve. So back in 2021, uh, I attended Freedom Session, and I found healing and redemption uh, through opening my heart to Christ. And when I saw the healing, uh, not only through my own life and through others, that really opened up the door that God was calling me to serve uh, in Freedom Session, and that was my give back. So the second year I attended Freedom Session as a facilitator and led a men's group, and I just saw what God was doing uh, to these men um, and all the healing that they had received. I felt at that point that God really put on my heart is that you're gonna be a connector. You know, you're gonna reach out to these guys, you're gonna bond people that aren't used to having fellowship, and you're gonna just build a, a community. Uh, an opportunity came uh, my way to lead a boys group in Freedom Session. I was very reluctant on it, but when God has a calling on for you, um, you follow that calling. And so he opened that door for me to lead these boys uh, in Freedom Session. I also serve on youth. One day a friend just kind of came up to me and said, hey, they're, uh, they're looking for leaders to, for Gleanings, which is a mission trip in California. And she also said that you should reach out to Pastor Jessica, who's actually gonna be leading that mission trip. And she's actually been in charge of youth. I, I met up with her and she invited me to come to youth. And I came and started attending more. And then I attended the Gleanings mission trip. And I think after that, when we came back is when God was just like, this is where you need to be. You know, and so I'm like, I'm not gonna fight it. I'm not gonna ask questions. And, and that's since, since July, that's where I've been every Wednesday is serving with the youth, showing them that they're not alone in their walk. And I don't want these kids to have to go through, you know, things that I went through um, from ages 15 to all the way to 40, you know, when I found Christ and I found healing and I felt uh, community just to see the miracles that are happening in Freedom Session and the miracles that are happening down in the youth uh, just makes you more hungry. It m makes my life actually more full and complete. Uh, you don't need to have a long resume at all. Just the willingness to serve is, you know, right in your heart and following the Holy Spirit where it leads you. This is more than just myself and anybody else. It's all about Christ. Thanks for sharing that story. I think uh, when he said, uh, I, don't, I don't want the young people today to have to go through the same things I went through from 15 to 40, how many of us have some scars and some years of our life that we said, man, I don't want to see anybody have to go through some of the pain I went through during that time in my life? And, and I think that God wants to redeem some of the hardship, some of the things that we've gone through, and he wants to use that to bless somebody else. And can you imagine the suffering, the unfairness, the injustice that you walked through? And can you imagine God taking that pain and using it to bless somebody else? That redeems the pain that you went through. To say, God, I didn't want to go through this. If I could go back, I wouldn't go through this. But because I went through this and I can't change that, I want to use this for good to help somebody else. And so I love people with that kind of mentality. As I was uh, praying for this message, I thought I'd just go ahead and share. I'm always challenging people, share your story, share your story over and over again. Share your story till you've shared it a thousand times. So a little bit of my story for those of you that don't know. Um, when I gave my life to Christ, I was about 15 and a half years old. And I got serious about God, but I hadn't found my place of serving in ministry. And so when I was 19 years old, I was serving God. I was coming to church, but you know, I'd help out if somebody called. But honestly, I was a little bit like, I just want to kind of have faith at my speed, at my preference. You know, I didn't want to like every Sunday I got to serve here or every Wednesday I got to serve there. I just kind of wanted to kind of keep my options open. And the youth pastor came to me at the time and he said, will you come and uh, coach the youth softball team? 
And, uh, and I was in the parking lot. I'll never forget it. I was standing in the parking lot, and I'd seen the youth softball team, and I said, oh, heck no. <laughs> they were terrible. I'd seen them play. I didn't want to be any part of that. And, and, you know, he said, hey, if you don't coach, you know, there won't be a team. And I said, That's, that, I'm sorry for your, your, your church. You know, I can't do that. And, and uh, then he pulled out his checkbook, and he said, how about now? Because I said, I, said I, won't play, I can't play. I can't even afford the league fee. And he wrote a personal check to the league fee. And he handed the check to me, and he said, okay, will you come be a youth leader and play it and coach the softball team now? And everything, like, some people are just pushy, right? <laughs> All right, I'll go coach the team. And so I go to this church in town. I've never been in their building before I walk in, and they put up these slides. It's as real to me as it was 30 years ago. And they put up the A division, and there was all the teams in the B division, in the C division. I think maybe our men's team was up there. They get down to, like, the E division. And then they got the final division, and they said, these people, they have good hearts. And I hadn't seen the team I'm inheriting yet. And I was like, oh, gosh, Lord. And they showed everybody's record. And the worst division in the worst team in the church softball league was the team I just inherited. And I was like, this is not going to be the way it is. So we went out to practice the first practice. And I'm hitting ground balls. And, I, like, not just one, two, three, or four of them. They're like, you're hitting them too hard. We're not used to this. <laughs> and I was like, I was still kind of fresh in my faith. I said, that's because you're used to being losers. And that's not going to happen anymore. <laughs> like, Jesus doesn't want a bunch of losers, you know. <laughs> he wants winners. So let's take care of this. And God sucked me into ministry through that. And then that I got involved in youth ministry because of that. And there was somebody teaching junior high. And so I saw that they needed help. And so I went to help out. And they said, you're teaching the lesson. I said, great. I've never done this before in my life. I prepared a, a lesson. It's supposed to be 25 minutes. I preached for like 10 or 12 minutes. I'm done. I mean, if you heard my story, like I don't know how to be one of those guys that just keeps talking. Um, and so I was done after 10 or 12 minutes. I taught about spiritual training has, or physical training has value for some things, but spiritual strength, spiritual training has value for all things, right? It's in 1 Timothy. And I thought it was so great. Like, hey, you can be spiritually strong, but, or physically strong, but how about instead you get spiritually strong? Look in the mirror and you actually have some spiritual muscles. And I thought, this is great. And I thought, am I done? I looked down at my watch and I've been 10 minutes into a 25 minute message. And I couldn't end early because I'd come back to the high school. So I said, God, what do I do? So I had everybody bow their heads, close their eyes. I said, at this point in the uh, teaching, we're all going to, you know, this is the halfway, halftime thing. And we're going to just bow our heads for a moment. And then we're going to continue. And I pretended like I knew what I was doing, but I didn't know what I was doing. And my mom had told me, my mom had told me this. When I'm 15 years old, God told me when you were in the womb that you were going to be a pastor and your name should be Peter. What do you think a 15-year-old boy thinks of that? That's sweet, Mom. That's a nice notion. And so I'm standing there. I'm like, I knew I couldn't do this. I know this will never happen. I'll never actually be a pastor. What, what, was, what was she thinking? What was I thinking? You know, what's going on here? And I, after all the students bowed their heads. And I remember saying so clearly, like, God, I, I don't think I can do this. I don't know what to do. All I heard was go to where you read the Bible today. Just go to your devotion where you read the Bible today. All right, God. I don't know how this is going to work. Open to the Bible, 1 Samuel 17. There it is. David says, you come against me with the sword and the spear and the javelin, those physical weapons, but I come against you in the name and the power of God Almighty of Israel. And it was spiritual strength destroying the physical strength. And I looked at that, and I high five students on the way out, and I just got hijacked by the Holy Spirit. And I remember just thinking, what just happened? And once again, I said, God, I can't do this. And God said, I know. I know you can't, but you and I can. And I'm going to ask you this question today. What, how many things are there that you would say, God, I can't do this? And maybe you're right, but God would say, but you and I can. God, I can't go on this trip. I can't, I can't commit in ministry. I can't give. I can't serve. I, all the things that we don't feel like we're able to do or gifted to do. And the whole point of this is there's a lot of things that we can't do. That's why we need God. Like, I can't earn myself to heaven by being good enough. I've tried. It doesn't work. It works for maybe two, three hours, right? I need Jesus. I need God's grace and forgiveness in my life every day. And so do you. And so um, I want to challenge you. If you haven't found your place where you're your best fit in serving God, not because somebody called you and said, would you help out? You can do that. But, like, find that place where you serve on a regular basis, and you don't need somebody to beg you to do it. You just do it because you do it as unto the Lord. I'm doing this for God, not for myself. There's sacrifice involved. 
I look at our church sometimes, and I, I see people have been youth leaders for like three decades. And I drive onto our campus sometimes, and I, I see, you know, like 50 cars here sometime before I get here on Sunday morning. What are all these people doing? They're all serving. They all work during the week, and they come early, and they set up all the ministries that are happening all over the campuses. Like, this is incredible. Like, why do people do this? I think we do this because God's gotten a hold of our lives. And that's why we serve the way we do. So if you haven't found your place of service, uh, during the next few weeks, there's going to be a volunteer table in the lobby. And if you're just like, man, I, I know i got to serve somewhere. I don't know where. Or I've got an idea where I'd like to serve, but I need to talk to somebody to get connected. Make sure you stop by there in the gathering today, all right? So last week we talked about Peter, and he, he brought the good news to the Gentiles. And uh, I showed a video because this series is called All In. I showed a video about jumping out of an airplane um, because there's nothing more all in than the moment you get out of the plane. Like, unlike the video, you can't be sucked back in. Like, once you're out, you're out. And so when you're leaning over the edge of that airplane, you're like, am I all in or am I not? And, um, and I saw a video years ago. I, these extreme sports kind of just enthrall me because give me a ball, I can play it. But if it's got skis or a skateboard or a snowboard, I'm out. I can't do it. Like, you guys got balance. I don't have. And so I saw this video, and I remember seeing this guy on a motorcycle, and he's doing like a Superman thing. Have you seen those? They do all these flips and Superman. And I remember he let go of the entire motorcycle, like, you know, mid-height, way up in the air. And just being amazed, like, you know, that's all in. Like, if you can let go, and you, and you can still grab a hold of it again. Because how many times do you let go, and then you can't grasp the bike again and get back on? So I have a little video I want to show you. Um, just amazes me of someone taking a, a ride like this. And this is pretty amazing as it is. But when you let go, not with one hand, but when you actually let go with two hands right there. Hey, that's crazy. How does somebody do that? How, how do you just go, I'm all in right here. And if I go to grab the bike and I slip, um, I guess I'm, I'm toast, right? And I think sometimes with God, we have to say, Lord, this is risky. This is scary. I can't control the outcome. Yeah, that's called faith. Like if you're only going to do what you can control the outcome, what you understand, you're never going to do something that's really faith-filled and incredible. You have to sign up for something that's bigger uh, than you are and that you can't really do. The reality is this. Uh, in our lives, we all often have ideals. Like, I'm a real ideal person. Like, oh, this is how it's going to work out. We're going to do this and this and this, you know. I'm going to go to college. I'm going to get married. I'm going to buy a house with a white picket fence. I'm going to have 2.7 kids. And we're going to, you know, and we get these ideas of what we're going to do, right? And maybe you have an idea of your, you know, what your life is going to look like or, or your week is going to look like. Does it ever go according to plan? I mean, it doesn't for me. I always have this brilliant idea. So Friday night, the sun was shining. I had paddleboarded like eight times this summer, but I hadn't gotten a kayak once. And I said, I am getting in a kayak before this summer is over. Like, this is a summer protest. And so I, I got the kayak out, went by myself, and went, by, went and got a burrito beforehand. And I thought, you know, I was going to eat dinner, but I'm going to eat dinner on a kayak. I'm going to eat this, this giant burrito on a kayak in the sunshine. It's going to be a mess. I'm going to take a picture of me eating this burrito on the lake, and all my friends will be like, oh, man, you're out in the sunshine eating Chipotle. Like, you got the life. Then I try to eat a burrito on a kayak. <laughs> I can't eat a burrito without getting it all over me in the restaurants. And I'm trying to eat this burrito. I'm fumbling around. And I, I haven't really eaten a burrito on a kayak yet because most of it ended up on my shirt or in the boats. And the funny thing is people are paddleboarding. They were like, look at me. Is that guy eating a burrito and a kayak? And I was like, please don't let them be from my church. Please don't let them be from my church. I was like, this is a terrible idea. And sometimes we have these ideas of what might be fun or might, might work out best. But here's what I know about God. Even though it might be a rocky road and some hardship and rivers and all that stuff, when it gets to the end, if it's God's plan for your life, that's the best plan. Sign up, jump in, see what God will do in your life. So if you have a Bible today, um, Matthew chapter 25 is the parable. Sometimes you call it the parable of the servants or the parable of the talents. And this, uh, this passage, 20, Matthew 25, 14, has become very real and meaningful to me. And one of the reasons I like it is because good teachers, good coaches, good pastors, good parents know this, that we need to be challenged in our lives. You can't coddle people and love on them and expect them to reach their full potential. The only, reason, the, way, the only way you're reaching your full potential is if someone's challenging you, and hear me on this, and if you challenge yourself. Yeah. You can't say, well, I don't serve in ministry because nobody's asked me to, because God's asked you to. So we need to challenge ourselves to step up. 
And I love it in any text like this, and so Jesus knows that we need to be challenged. Like he, he's God. He created us, right? So Matthew chapter 25 is this, um, this parable, this story with the purpose that Jesus tells. Now, what we don't really grasp as well as they do is that there are owners of vineyards, there were owners of farms, and they would own the land, but they would hire a steward to manage the land. And the manager or the steward uh, would, would steward the land for the manager, but he'd also hire up other servants to, to, make, to take care of the land. And so everybody in this time knew about this, how this worked. So this is what Jesus says to his people or those listening. Matthew 25, 14. Again, the kingdom of heaven will be illustrated uh, by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and he entrusted his money to them entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last one, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. Then he left on his trip. The servant who had received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant who had uh, received two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who had received one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called to them to give an account of how they had used his money. And the servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more. Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. Now I will give you much more responsibility. Let's celebrate together. Um. Verse 22, the servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. Again, doubling what I had. And the master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling the small amount. Now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver came, and this is how Jesus tells the story, and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh, uh, um, a harsh man harvesting crops where you did not plant And gathering crops where you did not cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops and I I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't uh, cultivate, why why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one who has ten bags of silver. To those uh, who use well what they are given, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance. But for those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken from them. Now throw out this useless servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Ouch, that last part kind of bites, doesn't it? I think Jesus understood this. And they understood. If you know how an earthly owner would respond. This is how a boss in that time would respond. What? I trusted you with my property and you did nothing with it. Jesus says, if that's how an earthly boss would respond, how much more important not to waste what almighty God has entrusted to you. That's what's really important. You are responsible for what God has entrusted to you. And that's all of us. You have gifts that I don't have. You have abilities that I don't have. Uh, you have talents and friendships and relationships and finances. Well, I don't know what are the resources you have, but whatever God has entrusted to you, that's what you're responsible for. You're not responsible for somebody else and whether they use their gifts or not. Right? Maybe if you're a parent, you're trying to help out, but really everybody has that own responsibility. I'm not responsible for Bill Gates' money. I'd like to borrow his wallet. I have some projects I'd like to give to, all right? but he's responsible for that i got to look at myself and say, God, how am I honoring you with with my resources in my life? We sometimes call this uh, honoring God with your time, your talent, and your treasure. And every time I think of this passage, I remember the first time I preached about it, and I realized, time-wise, everybody has 1,440 minutes in a day. That's not you, not the person, everybody. We all have the same minutes in the day. 24 hours, 1,440 minutes. If you live 80 years, you'll have 48 million minutes plus in your life. 48 million minutes. What are we doing with all this time that God's given to us? We're responsible to God for the time, talent, and the treasure that he's put in our lives. I want to just challenge you with this thought. Sometimes people go, and this is what usually people say. Well, I, I'm not like the person who hasn't been given much. I mean, I'm born in America, for one. But I'm not the person who's been given a lot. I'm kind of in the middle. Everybody sees themselves as the two-bagger, Right? I've kind of been given the middle amount. 
I want to challenge you. I think many of us here in this room, God has actually given us much. Probably when many of us read this, we're more of the five bags of silver. Jesus said to you, much is given, much is required. And if we've been given much, we need to be faithful with much. Some of you, you are intellectually smart. I mean, you have, you have some wisdom. You have some discernment. You're educated. Maybe you have an inheritance or you're a, you have a high-paying job. Or maybe you're just a high-capacity person. Or maybe you're fantastic with people. Like, people just like you. And they flock to you, and you have this ability with people that most people don't have. And I'm here to tell you, many of us here, we're actually high capacity, and we just don't want to admit it. But God knows that about you. Your friends and family probably know that about you. And God's given you much. Let's make sure we're faithful with much of what God's entrusted to us in our lives. Point number one is this in the message today. Um, Do you view yourself as an owner or a manager? Like, this, this is where the rubber meets the road, where we really kind of realize, hey, am, do I own everything in my life? Am I self-made, or am I a manager and God owns everything? It's kind of a paradigm uh, switch. Um, everything, either all I have is mine, or everything in the world is God's. In fact, Psalm 24 says, says this flat out, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The Bible says that you and I are just passing through. Naked you came into this world, and naked you will leave. I don't want to make this awkward, but the person next to you, they came into this world naked. <laughs> no diaper, uh-uh. Buck naked, right? Naked, you come into this world naked, you will leave. And it's easy to sometimes feel like we are owners, but we're really not owners. Like God's going to give you a certain amount of minutes or hours, a certain amount of resources to manage. And when you leave this planet, you're going out with nothing more you came in with. Do you realize that? You get to manage for a while. You get to be faithful to God with what he's entrusted to you for a while. By the way, that's also your relationships. It's not just what God's entrusted to you, but it's who. Who's God entrusted to you? Do you have some kids or some grandkids? Do you have somebody that's your neighbor that God said, I want you to minister to that person? Be faithful with who God's entrusted to you as well. So we are not owners. God's the owner of everything. We are the managers. Now, this is a big deal because when I feel like, hey, I made this money, you know, I, I've got these skills, i got these abilities, and I might tip God and help him out a little bit here and there, that, that's one way to look at your life. But when you decide, actually, God owns everything, he gave me this body, He gave me these resources. He gave me my mind. He owns it all. And someday I'm going back and returning to my spirit, and I'm not going to have a body, and this life's going to be over. He's the owner, and I'm just a manager passing through. So, God, whatever you bless me with in this life, I'm going to be faithful to you with it every step of the way. My favorite way to illustrate that is the first house that Stacy and I bought. Uh, we, I was 28, she was 26. We bought a house. We were so excited about it. I remember the day it became ours. If you've ever done this, remember that you sign all these documents and you feel like you know, I, that was a big deal, right? And they hand you a key and you go to your house. And I stood on my front lawn and I love to tell this story because it just hits home so well. And I looked at this little skinny maple tree in our front yard and I got excited. And I said, Stacy, do you see that tree? You know who owns it, don't you? I own that tree. Right? I lived in dorms. I lived in apartments. And I said, do you see this dirt? This dirt, like, I own it. Like, I own, we own dirt. Like, we are land barons. <laughs> this point one, two acres uh, off Ruddle Road. Like, we own it. I'm excited about that. Like, first this, next, Dagon Tower, because I'm going big time, baby. Like, I just thought I owned so much. It didn't take long for me to realize I put 3% down. The bank owned 97% of that property. Think about that. I didn't own it. They owned me, right? The bank owned it. Somebody else owned it before them, but really their bank owned it. Somebody owned it before them, but their bank owned it. Native Americans owned it before them, and the buffalo owned it before them. But listen, God owns it all. He always has and always will, no matter what Americans put on paper. He owns everything. Like, he created everything, the earth and everything in it. So if you could possibly get a hold of this concept i'm not an owner i'm a manager and what i do with these hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars that go through my hands i want to honor god with that and all these relationships that i have i want to honor god with these relationships and all these hours and all these months and all these years 
I want to be faithful to God when these years are done because one day I'm standing before God. And man, that day, I want to say, Lord, I honored you with what you entrusted to me in my life. Do you view yourself as an owner or a manager? That's going to shape how you live your life. Um, Verse 14 says it like this. The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and he entrusted his money to them. Because it's his, the owner's money, not ours. So here's the question. What has God entrusted to you? Who has God entrusted to you? What resources has God entrusted to you? What abilities and talents do you have that you can serve God with those abilities and talents? How much have you been given? And perhaps an even better question is, will you give God your best? Will you give God your best? Second question is this. Are you being faithful with what God has entrusted to you? Are you saying, I've identified what God's blessed me with, and I want to be faithful back to him with that? It's a good question. What are the unique gifts and talents and abilities that God's entrusted to you? 1 Corinthians chapter 4 says this. uh, Now a person who is put in charge as a manager must be faithful. If you're the owner owner of anything, you're not hiring a manager that you don't trust is going to be faithful with the responsibility you've given to them. And God expects you and I to be faithful to him. God expects us to take what he's given to him and use it for him. Verse 4 of the same chapter, it is the Lord himself who examines me and, uh, and, and decides. So we often ask this question, do you trust God? And I think another question to ask us, does God trust you? Could God trust you to lead a ministry? Could, could God trust you to lead a life group? Could God trust you with a really good income that he can trust you with that? Could God trust you with a, a young life that you will mold for him? How are we managing what God's trusted to us? Listen, don't squander your resources. Don't live as if everything matters on earth, but nothing matters for eternity. Understand that there's so much more that we cannot see. And if you can build something, if you can fix something, um, if you have uh, faith to start something, if you're a leader, an entrepreneur, if you're great with people, use your gifts for God, not just for yourself or for the here and now. Do your best with what God's given to you. After a long time, the scripture says their master returned from this trip and he called them to give an account of how they used his money. Someday, we are going to stand before God and give an account of how we spent our time, our talent, and our treasure. And if we consider that today, we won't be so surprised when that that day actually comes. How are we going to honor God with what he's entrusted to us? I have some friends that are in their 90s. I don't, know, I don't know if I want to live to be in my 90s, but I have some friends who have. And uh, over the years, I've counted up the, the amount of days and hours and minutes I've been alive. And it's kind of like thought-provoking because no one's promised any tomorrow to anyone, right? So sometimes I go, wow, God, I've, I've got 49 years. I wasn't sure I was going to get this many. I'm not promised 89 years. I'm not promised 99. I prefer 89 than 99, God, but you, you decide, Right? How much time will you and I have to make a difference for eternity in this life? And here's what's interesting. God expects us to take some risks in our life. You know, these guys are like, hey, this is a risk to do something with what God's entrusted to me. In fact, he's, they're under orders in Jesus' parable. They're under orders. Take a risk. Do something great. What's stopping you from having some faith and taking a risk in this life? God expects you to risk, watch this, what is his. And it's easy to risk things if it's not yours. We used to say this during the offering, like, you know, um, we're going to receive the offering. Take out your neighbor's wallet and give like you always wanted to, right? (laughs) It's easy to give when it doesn't cost you nothing. I remember being a kid, and they are like, hey, Johnny's having a birthday party. He's like, hey, Mom, you got to buy Johnny a birthday present. And I got to be a teenager, and they said, well, you got to buy your friend a birthday present. I got to spend my own money, right? All of a sudden, it gets real. Like, do I really mean this? This is really important to me in my life. The master is full of praise for those who take what they've been given and use it for him. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handing this small amount. Now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. I've been prone to say something like this. There's a lot of great rewards programs out there. The best rewards program is heaven. And it's better than Fred Meyer. Right? 
I don't want to stand before God with my money in his pockets, or his money in my pockets. Um, I need to reverse that one. That's kind of interesting how that works. I, I, I don't want to tell God I chase my dreams over his plans. I really want God's best for my life. I really want to stand before God one day and say, Lord, all my brokenness, all my selfishness, all of my issues, I still want to trust you with my life. I want to please you with my life. And sometimes people are like, well, I don't know. Like, if I really give God my whole life, you know, I don't know if I want to give up that kind of control. Or maybe God will ask me to do too much. Listen, you can't do everything, but you must do something. Churches are notorious for 20% of people like doing it like a ton of things and 80% not doing much. What if everybody does something and nobody gets burned out? It's just all the time I run into somebody, they find out what I do for a living, and they say something like this. Yeah, I have church hurt in my life. You know, like I've been hurt by religion or church or something like that. And I'm like, yeah, me too. Let's, let's talk about it, right? Because humans hurt humans. And sometimes there are people who served and served and served and served, and they burn out, and they feel like no one appreciated what they did. And we don't want that to be the MO of our church at all. Not the staff, not the super volunteers. We want everybody to volunteer so we're all, listen, because what would happen if we just said, don't volunteer, we don't need you to volunteer, we got it all covered. That's not even biblical. I can't even do that. The Bible says it's the pastor's job to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Everybody has to serve somewhere or else we're not actually living out the scripture. I go to a church that's so well run, they don't ask me to do anything. Go find a better church that will ask you to do something. It will actually challenge you to do something with your life and serve somewhere. And, and let me remind you of this. Doing nothing is an option. It's a terrible option, but it's an option. Right? The third servant does that. I did nothing with it. Man, the last thing I want to do is say, God, I did nothing with what you entrusted to me. Instead, we want to say, God, you can trust me. So here's a big question. Do you believe in God or are you actually serving God with your life? Do you just believe in God or are you actually serving God? Is there some teeth to your faith? Is there some action to your faith in your life? Uh, we like to talk about the word shape around here sometimes. I think it's a great acronym. I'm going to put it on the screen. Because the question is always this, how has God shaped you to serve? Like, what's, what's your best fit in, in ministry? And so we, we use this acronym SHAPE, and it talks about spiritual gifts. Um, and, and the Bible says that God gives spiritual gifts, like, you know, like, like uniquely supernatural, like he just gives you something that's for you. And if you don't know what those spiritual gifts are in your life, there's actually an inventory out of the table, at the volunteer table. You can take this little, like, 15, 20-minute quiz, and it'll actually help you identify some of God's spiritual gifts for you. And actually, um, we also ask you this question, where's your heart at? Because, like, if you don't like kids, we don't want you in kids' ministry, right? <laughs> I'll never forget this. When my son was born, he was in the hospital, and uh, it was in Portland. It was special surgery, nine days old, he had heart surgery. And they said, now, listen, there's one particular nurse. She's a little bit gruff. She's a good nurse, but she just has no bedside manner. And if you get her, and I was like, oh, we better not get her. We got her, right? <laughs> and I remember just thinking, like, couldn't you just be nice? Like, if you're going to be a nurse, couldn't you have some mercy and some compassion? Be nice. So where's your heart at? Serve where you have a heart. Uh, abilities. What are your talents? What are your abilities? Um, um, serve where you feel like God's gifted you somewhere. What's your personality? Some of you, you're task-oriented. Some of you, you're people-oriented. Some of you, you flow with chaos. You like the junior high lock-in event all night in the church. Some of you would leave the church if we asked you to serve the junior high lock-in, all right? <laughs> What's your personality? And what are your experiences? And I love what Brady said in, or, or what Barry said in his story. Because his experiences from 15 to 40 really shaped him. He wanted to make sure he helped some other people to avoid some scars, to make some good decisions. What are your experiences, both good and bad, that you would say, God, use me in this way? Some of you know the pain of divorce. You know the pain of losing a child, right? You know the pain of not having uh, spiritual parents that helped you. And you know the pain of feeling like you don't belong or you don't have a friend or you're not good enough. And I'm going to challenge you to use your experiences to help somebody else. So I don't know what your sweet spot in serving God is, but I really want to challenge you to find it. I really don't want anybody to feel like, I just don't have a place where I'm connected. You know, we kind of sometimes try to measure over the years. Do we have 
40% of our people serving in ministry? Do we have more than that, less than that? To tell you the truth, we have not caught up with where we were before COVID. We still don't have the same percentage of people serving in ministry that we're aware of. And we'd like to see it be stronger than ever before. If you have an idea of a ministry you could start, if you want to just come and say, where am I needed most? I can give God a couple hours a week. Make sure you're serving somewhere. So here's the two questions to go back to it. Number one, do you view yourself as an owner or a manager of everything that God's entrusted to you? Would you move towards a manager and understand you're passing through? And God's going to give you some days, some hours, some dollars, some friends, some opportunities, some gifts to serve. The second one is this. Are you being faithful to God with what he's entrusted to you? Can we bow our heads for a moment? Just maybe just let the spirit of God minister in this place. Lord, a pastor can preach a sermon, but only your spirit can bring anointing. Holy Spirit, you are the one who can convict us and challenge us to honor you. Lord, remind us that doing nothing is an option, but it's not the option that we want to take. Remind us, God, that one day we're going to stand before you and we want somebody to be in heaven because of our life. Remind us, God, how many thousands or millions of dollars will go through our hands in this life. God, point out to us our shape our spiritual gifts, our heart, our abilities, God, our personality, the things that we've walked through in life. And Lord, help us to use these things for you. Lord, remind us that those who are not faithful with what's been entrusted to them, they will realize it, but often when it's too late. So God, get a hold of our hearts, our lives today. Lord, would you show us where we can serve you best? And would you enable us, God, to give to build your kingdom? And God, would you speak to us about how blessed we are, how gifted we are by you? If God is speaking to you, I just want to give you a chance just to respond to him. Would you just slip up your hand and say, God, I know you're talking to me. Just, just throw it up. Between you and God, Lord, I know you're challenging me. Anybody else? Maybe 30, 40, 50 of us, our hands are God, I know you're talking to me. I want to make my life count. Anybody else? Okay, you can put it down. God, as we close out this gathering, there's nothing hidden from you. You know our lives. And you love us enough to affirm us, push us, challenge us, and help us to make the most of our lives. So God, today I pray new ministries would start. I pray, God, that ministry leaders who are hurting would find volunteer help today. I pray, God, some of us see our, ourselves as owners would understand that we are just managers passing through, and that would change everything of how we live. Mostly, God, help us to hear your voice and lead us into our future. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. So there's a table in the lobby. And um, I hope that if you're at all like thinking, I got to take that spiritual gifts test, stop by and grab that, that little uh, inventory. Or if you're not serving in ministry, stop by that table and say, how can I get involved in serving? All right. If there's a line, hang out for that um, till you can. But don't miss out that chance to serve. All right. God bless you. Thank you for being in church. Have a wonderful week. <laughs>